Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On this episode, I chat with Jim Scanlon, who is the head coach with the Bemidji State Women's Ice Hockey Program. We talk about him winning two national championships at Bemidji State as a player, his long coaching career, and how the Beavers were the last team to beat the recent national champions, Ohio State Buckeyes, with a remarkable last-second goal. This was a great conversation with Jim, so I hope you like it. Before we start the podcast, I wanted to let you know about the app in Champs App. Champs App lets you create a free, beautiful, online hockey resume to share with coaches, teams, and players. Your profile includes all the information coaches want to know to help decide if you are a player they want to keep on their recruiting radar. What makes Champs App unique is that you can then connect directly with college, prep, or team coaches, and they can then follow your updates. So when you add a new highlight video or a game to your schedule, they will automatically get notified of these changes to your profile. It's a really easy way to keep all your connections up to date. Just go to www.champs.app and click the sign up button to start your profile. And check out the links in the show notes to see a list of some of the college coaches already using Champs app that you can connect with. Stay tuned after the episode for more details on how easy it is to create your Champs app hockey resume. I'm very excited to have on the podcast Jim Scanlon, who is the winningest coach in the history of the Bemidji State Beavers women's hockey program. Hailing from Cottage Grove, Minnesota, Jim played as a goalie for the Bemidji State men's hockey team back in the late 70s and early 80s and had a safe percentage over 900, which back then is a pretty good number. Um, He then went on to a long coaching career in various assistant coach roles in Michigan and North Dakota before becoming a head coach at East Grand Forks High for 16 years, 10 with the boys team, 6 with the girls girls and for the last eight seasons he has been the head coach at his alma mater with the women's team since 2014 welcome to the podcast jim thank you ray appreciate uh, appreciate having me on thank you so much for designing to join us um i'm going to start off like i do all of our guests to ask you to tell us about how a little bit about your hockey history how you started playing hockey and what made you become a goalie you know what uh, probably not uh not as traditional as, as, as some of your your uh, previous guests i i i I come from a real large family. I have 10 brothers and sisters, uh, but uh, I was the only one to play hockey. Uh, my, wow. my dad was not a hockey player. Uh, he actually was a swimmer in college. Um, and I, I really, I probably give it, uh, the reason I started playing was because of a, a neighbor of mine, John Molzoff is his name. He lived two houses away and his boys both played. And uh, it was just, uh, it was just the, the neighborhood thing to do. And, uh, you know, I, I, I played a lot of ball hockey. Uh, a lot of garage hockey, uh, but it, it took a little bit to finally start playing actually ice hockey. And, and when I did, it was just the local, the local, obviously the local teams. And and I remember trying out for the squirt travel team because all my buddies were playing. And, and John was the coach. And he said, uh, and I think I tried out as a defenseman. And and he said, uh, uh, we don't, I can't keep you as a defenseman, but if you want to be our third goalie, I'll, I'll, you can be on the team. So I didn't hesitate. I said, absolutely. I'll be the third goalie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, it's just, you're, you're playing with all your buddies. That was, that was, the, that was the most important thing. But as that season went along, I, I eventually started, I eventually became the, the starting goalie. And that's kind of, that was kind of it. That from that point on, I was, I was a goalie. All right. So I got a couple of questions for you. So one, um, were you a good athlete at that time? Like, cause usually goalies need to be athletic. So like, you know, I'm assuming you were playing other sports that kind of, yeah, yeah, that, that, that was probably, probably my biggest attribute was my athleticism because I, again, I, I, I didn't start as early as some of my friends had started in terms of when they started playing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, being a good athlete certainly helped. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, you know, there's certainly some some real real important people along the way that that helped me out. But uh, you know, just the little things, just uh, you know, the, the 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 believe it or not, playing playing hockey in, in a basement with your buddies uh, it was something that you know, you're, as far as your reflex, because everything happened so fast, and you're using a little rubber ball and uh, you know, things like that. I think really really played a, a big role in, in in my development. Gotcha. And how was your skating at that point? You know, that was probably the one thing that got, obviously, I, I needed to work on the most, but uh, like anything else, you just keep working at it, just got, it got better and better. And, and, and again, that was one of my, one of my strengths as, as I got older was my ability to move my feet. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So I'm, I'm going to kind of keep us moving through this one, but how did you end up at Bemidji State playing goalie? 
Yeah, you know, I, I, I had a, uh, my senior year, I started getting some interest from some schools. I, I heard from the University of Pennsylvania. They probably had the most interest. And then uh, also the University of or Notre Dame was another school that contacted me. And, heard of them. Uh, uh, University of Penn actually dropped their program uh, yeah. the spring of my senior year. They stopped, they stopped their hockey program. And Notre Dame uh, grabbed another goalie out of the state of Minnesota by the name of Dave Warren from uh, International Falls. So uh, it was, again, it was, it was pretty late in the spring. And, and I remember reading, reading a story about Bemidji State. And uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, Bob Peters had reached out to a, another good friend of mine, uh, uh, Marv Jordy. And, uh, you know, through, through that connection, and, and my high school coach was Skip Peltier, who uh, went on to become a, a director of the Minnesota State High School League. But uh, through their connections with coach, that's that's how that's how I wound up coming up here. Okay, um, so you mentioned Bob Peters. Tell me about Bob Peters and the role he's just played in your hockey career, because I understand he's had a big influence on you. Yeah, absolutely. He, he, you know, next to my parents, certainly the biggest influence in my life. I would not be in this job had I not come here and played for him. Uh, just a remarkable, remarkable human being that, that was not only a, a tremendous hockey coach tactically, just the way he went about. Uh, teaching the game, but just, uh, you know, there's, there's so many, so many of us uh, that, that played for him that went, went into coaching, got into coaching. I mean, his coaching tree is, is unbelievable. The number of, of, of former players that are now, or, or, you know, have coached or are coaching, whatever it is, but yeah, just a, a, a tremendous influence uh, in my life. And um, again, I, I would not be here today if, if, if I had not played for coach Bob Peters. Gotcha. And so in the four years that you played for him, what was your, you know, biggest highlight in those four years uh, playing in Nets? Oh, obviously, we, we, we were, I was fortunate enough to be on two teams that won national championships. And my, my very first year, my freshman year, I, I didn't play a whole lot, but it was, we had a, we had nine seniors that year that were just unbelievable leaders. And, and they had, they had played in, in their three previous years, they had finished fourth, third, and second at the national tournament. Uh, and we were playing in the NAI back then. And so th that team was so, was so focused and so driven and the goal was to win a national championship. So, so to be a part of that as a freshman uh, was again, tremendous in terms of, of my developments and just seeing how focused and how, how uh, uh, you know, the commitment that you had to make and, and to be a part of that was, was tremendous. Like I said, I only, I think I wound up playing maybe uh, I think I had one game and I finished maybe a third period of another game. And you know, I, I think I had about 80 minutes total, but, it was just such an unbelievable feeling. And then we did win the national championship. Uh, and then we, we came back and did it again my, 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 uh, my sophomore year. And, and fortunately, I, I played a larger role and I, I played yeah. most of the game. So uh, to win to win back to back national championships was, was pretty was pretty fun. Got it. And, um, you know, what made you so successful? Like I kind of mentioned in the intro that you had it over 900 save percentage. You know, was it some great D in front of you or were you really that good? Oh, absolutely played played with uh, had some tremendous teammates and again coaches coaches uh, you know the way he the way he taught the game how he uh, how he went about it you know the one thing about Coach Peters he he was a goalie himself so he was one of the first one, first coaches that I that I worked with and had had the opportunity to spend time with it kind of kept the goalie in mind when it came to practices there was nothing we ever saw in a game that we already hadn't seen in practice and he was really particular about that and. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, we had we had some tremendous defensemen, obviously some uh, great players, and we were just a hard team to play against. So, you know, you, you rarely had games where you, you know you had to you know, where you had to steal the game as the goalie. But you you know you again you make you make the saves you're supposed to, and maybe come up with a couple of big ones, and, and that would go a long way, obviously, to to helping our team be successful. But I was I was no question I was the beneficiary of some really really talented players. <laughs> got it, got it. So when did you decide you wanted to become a coach? As you're kind of winding up your you know your 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 degree at Bemidji State, you know, what, did you go immediately into coaching, or did, was it something that you? Decided no, I, a little I bit had after? I I had that dream of playing. I had that dream of playing. I'm fortunate. I, I, I received a, a tryout offer from the Buffalo Sabers, so I I got an opportunity to go to their camp uh, in the fall of uh, of '82. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of went through their system uh, without a contract. So I, I, I'd kind of get bumped uh, each, each step of the way. I wound up down to South Carolina uh, in the East Coast League. And I was, I was there for a while, but again, got bumped by a goalie that came down with a contract. So I was actually uh, on a bus heading home and I got a call from Cal Marvin, who 
who was the, he ran an outfit called the World Lakers up in World, Minnesota. It was a senior men's team that played in the, in the Cash League up in, up in uh, Bay, primarily in Manitoba, but there was also a really good team out of Thunder Bay. And, and uh, it was an opportunity to continue playing at, at a pretty high level. And, uh, and so I, 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 I took that, I took that opportunity, went up and played for him. And, and uh, I, I actually was, it was towards the end of my first year, I got a call from South Carolina. They wanted me to, they wanted me to come back for a playoff run. And I, I called coach Peters kind of asking his advice. And he just said, you know, if you're loyal to Cal Marvin, he's going to be loyal to you, which was basically kind of telling me, you know what, you, you might want to just stay where you're at. And, and again, he was, he was spot on because, as it turned out, uh, a few years later, when I when I had applied at the University of North Dakota as an, for an assistant position, Cal played a big part in, in helping me land that job. So, stayed and played for Cal for another year, uh, second year, and it was at the end of that year that uh, a friend of mine, Mike Gibbons, who was an assistant at, at Northern Michigan University, uh, called and asked me if I'd be interested in, in coming over there and being a graduate assistant goalie coach. And I still had to do my student teaching because I, I never had finished that up when, when I when I finished uh, my undergrad degree. So uh, I, I said, yeah, I'd love to come out. And Rick Conley was the head coach. Walt Kyle was the other assistant coach. Uh, and and, a, and a, a, just a great experience working working under Rick and Walt and Mike and got my student teaching done. And uh, I, was there, I was there the one year when, when a, an assistant job opened up at Western Michigan. And I remember, I remember reading, uh, reading West Michigan was in Kalamazoo, and I had no idea where Kalamazoo, Michigan was. So, um, <laughs> yeah. wound up getting the job there as a, as a full time assistant the, the very next year. So, um, really fortunate. Bill Wilkinson was the head coach. Uh, Tom Newton was the other assistant coach, and again, just a, a great experience uh, working for those guys. So, what was that magic moment when the light bulb went off in your brain, saying like, "I want to do, I want to be a coach for." For the rest of my life, like for the rest of my career. You know, That's I, that, I, I what switched my degree like? from, yeah, my, I, I initially was uh, going to go into communications. I was going to be a broadcaster. I was going to do stuff, something like what you're doing now, where you're going to maybe talk into a microphone. But then I, I kind of, you know, having, again, playing for coach and just how he went about things, and, you know, the, started thinking about maybe maybe coaching would be something I'd be I'd be interested in. So I switched my my degree more into in the, in the education realm. And, uh you know, I just thought, again, my mom was a teacher. I had some really, really uh, uh, great uh, teachers growing up that, that, that played a big part in my life. And I thought, you know, to have, have the ability to, 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 you know, leave a positive imprint in somebody's life, you know, that, that was uh, something that, that really uh, intrigued me. So that was kind of the idea was to go into teaching. And that just kind of followed into, you know, then obviously the opportunity to, to, to teach the game that you play, the game that you love. And and then get paid for it. It was like, yeah, are you kidding me? Is this, is this, is this, really <laughs> I mean, I went to Northern Michigan, just obviously the, the idea was to, to, to learn, learn from Rick, but also to finish my, my degree, get that teaching yeah, license. Yeah. And then obviously maybe start looking for a teaching job. Then it just turned into that, that opportunity at Western Michigan. And uh, you know, it's, it's so different now. It, it, it's just to follow, have that happen probably wouldn't happen uh, today, but I was really, really fortunate. Gotcha. And you mentioned a little bit earlier that, uh, you know, you, you um, ended up at North Dakota. Tell, tell us about that transition, obviously much closer to home, um, uh, you know, yeah. a couple hours away. So t tell us about that move west. Yeah, that was, that was, that was really, really big. It was, uh, again, I'd been, at, I'd been at Western for, I just finished up my fourth year when, when actually Dean Blaze had uh, uh, left the University of North Dakota. I think he, he went to, uh, he might've gone to, to the, uh, high school hockey at the time but he, he made a transition and there was a there was a job opening and then you know I'd applied for it and, and uh uh it was really 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 fortunate to to get the job there my wife is actually from a little town called Forest River which is just north of Grand Forks and gotcha. uh so it was just an opportunity to obviously closer to her family back in the midwest and North Dakota was obviously a legendary program at the time Gino Gasparini was the head coach Carrie Eads was was one of the assistants and uh, again, having the opportunity to work for those guys uh, was was a tremendous opportunity. I was really fortunate to get that job. Gotcha. And so, what made you then transition from college hockey to high school hockey? Because then you then moved to East Grand Forks High. Yeah, it was it was I was with Dean for or I'm sorry, Gino for five years, and then Dean came on board, uh, and I spent two years with Dean and and uh, Scott Sandlin was was the other assistant at the time. Yeah. So again, just. Uh, 
I've been really fortunate in my career to work with some tremendous coaches, but uh, truth be told, I, I, I was not getting my contract renewed. So I had, a, I had to start, I had, to, and I had, a, I had a pretty young family at the time. So uh, I was just really fortunate that the high school job at East Grand Forks was open. And again, ha having spent seven years at, in Grand Forks, there was definitely some familiarity there with, with some of the people at, at East Grand Forks Senior High. And, and it, it worked out. I, I, was, I was able to, to get the job and, and they were really good about creating opportunities for me to teach. I mean, it, it was, I wound up teaching at the middle school. I was, I was, uh, I was in, a, I taught uh, keyboarding and uh, some other things. I mean, they just found, found uh, areas for me to, for me to teach. And uh, again, a great experience, you know, to be a, be a head, head, head coach at a boys high school team in, 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 in Minnesota was, it was a, uh, a great experience for me. Gotcha. So you, you did 10 years with the boys. What made you yep. then transition to the girls? And what was that transition like? Yeah, well, the, probably the biggest reason I, I, I had three kids at the time. My, my oldest daughter was a basketball player. And I, I was, I, had, I think after my third year, I became the athletic director at East Grand Forks. So I was the athletic director, the, the boys high school coach. And, and I just didn't get to see her play much uh, of her own. She was a basketball player. And, and I very rarely got to see her play because if I, Obviously, as as a hockey coach, you're gone. You know, you you got your own games going on. So, after ten years, she was going into her senior year. I thought I'm just gonna I'm just gonna step back. The athletic job was was busy enough. My middle daughter was playing hockey. She was playing uh, uh, fourteen U or fifteen U at the time. I can't remember which one. And I was able to help out on her team when I could, which kind of kept me involved a little bit with hockey. And uh, I think it was just two years, maybe. Two or three years, our, our our girls' coach at the time, it was in July, he called me and said, I'm going to resign as a girls' coach. And it was kind of real late in the process, trying to find, obviously, a, a, a teacher for that position. So my superintendent, uh, my, my my middle daughter was going to be a, a sophomore in high school, and she had played varsity hockey the year before. And my superintendent said, well, why don't you just take the job? You're, you're, you're going to be at most of her games anyway. So <laughs> the plan was, all right, I'll coach, I'll coach, I'll coach those three years. And, uh, but those three turned into six and it was, uh, the transition was, was, it was pretty smooth. I mean, it was again, high, you know, obviously you, you go from coaching boys to girls, but the game, the game itself was the same. And, and the girls were just, uh, were so, uh, receptive there. They, they were, you know, they, they were, it was, they made it really easy. And I had, a, I had a, I had a really good staff to work with. So, uh, that was, that was the biggest, the biggest thing for me was making sure that the, the players were were comfortable and they they accepted it and it was it was like I said it went went from th the plan was three years and it turned into six. Wow! So I'm assuming then all your girls kind of then you saw them all the way through high school and uh, and then yeah well my yeah my middle daughter yeah but my my, my our third was uh, my son Joe was actually he was a he was a baseball player so he okay. he played hockey he played youth hockey but then he he, he kind of got fell in love with baseball so that's what he kind of pursued. That's right. Uh, I believe I heard that uh, that he he also he went on to play college baseball. If, if well, I remember he, that correctly. He came, yeah, he came here to Bemidji State as well. So yeah, my my oldest daughter came to Bemidji State. She played soccer, and my son came here to Bemidji State as well. So perfect. So let's now transition into Bemidji State. So uh, I'm assuming at some point, then either you applied or you got a phone call from your uh, alma mater. Yeah, uh, again, not not something I had planned. Not something I was looking for. It was just uh, it was actually my my. Uh, I had a volunteer so I applied to be your assistant at Bemidji State. And I'm going, what are you talking about? I mean, I wrote back to her, what do you, what do you mean? She just said that, that you know, Steve Surditch has announced his resignation. So I figure you're going to be the next head coach there. And I, I have <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. But I, I did get a call from a friend over here said, you should you should consider it. And, uh, you know, talked it over with my wife. And, and uh, you know, she was very uh, encouraging and, and Next thing you know, here I am. So it was, it was, uh, it was kind of a whirlwind. It, like I said, had not been looking for it, and, it, and, and it, you know, it, it was almost like from April to May, and bang, here, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm the head coach of Bemidji State. Yeah, and, and you're truly a Bemidji family, right? Like you said, you have uh, at least two kids. We are. There, yeah, my, yeah. My, uh, I met my wife here. Uh, my, like I said, my daughter came here. She met her current husband. Here at Bemidji State, and my son, who's now uh, he's engaged, he he met his future wife here at Bemidji State. So, 
Gotcha. Uh, it's had a big, big in influence and a big part of my, my life, this, this institution. All right, well, let's talk about Bemidji State University. Um, it's actually, correct me if I'm wrong, closer to Fargo than it is to Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, within this, it is, you yeah. know, ge geographically. Um, it's got about 6,000 students. Um, Bucky the Beaver is your uh, mascot. And, um, <laughs> you know, tell us about the, the, the academics. Tell us about the campus. Uh, tell us about the uh, hockey facilities like the Sanford Center, uh, Robert Peters Rink. Um, you know, tell us about what people need to know about the school. Yeah, well, yeah, first of all, our role is not quite that high. We'd, we'd love it to be that high, but it's, it's uh, more, more in the 4,000 undergrad right now. Okay. Uh, but it's a, it's a liberal, liberal arts, uh, about 65 undergraduate degrees, about 15 graduate degrees. Uh, but it's, 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 it's very unique in our league, right? We're, we're by far the smallest in terms of enrollment, and, and, the, and the community itself is probably the smallest. But it, it's, it's, it's like going to a, going to, going to a lake cabin, uh, for four years. I mean, it's, it, the campus sits right on the edge of, of, of Lake Bemidji. I mean, you, you're, you, I mean, there's, the students use it as a parking lot, the lake, during the winter. <laughs> uh, we, I, I, I had uh, classmates that I know that lived in their fish house to save money, uh, and they just run up to the, run up to the university, the field house to shower. Um, yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's an outdoorsman's paradise. I mean, if you're, if you love hunting and fishing, there's no better place to to go to school, uh, and, and it's a, it's a again the campus is, is it, the way it's situated very easy to get around. Uh, there's tunnels that that connect just about every building, so on those bitterly cold days you don't even have to go outside if you if you don't want to. Yeah, and we have a world class facility that you can see right behind you there. It's 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 beautiful. Uh, the, the Sanford Center is a is an outstanding facility. It seats a little over forty two hundred. Uh, we've got all the amenities you, you can think of our locker room, our weight room, training room, everything, everything's right here. Uh, it, it's a beautiful facility. And it, uh, again, we're unique in the league. And that's, that's one of our selling points. If, if you're looking for a big school, big university, obviously, you know, we're probably not going to be a high on your list, but if it's a, if it's a smaller, you know, you're looking for a smaller school with, with a little bit more uh, intimate relationship with your, your, your professors, uh, Bemidji State would certainly be very, very attractive. Uh, the, the community itself, we're about 12,000 within the city limits, but as you get further and further outside of the, the city limits, the population actually grows because of the number of lakes and the number of townships and, and, and communities that, are, that are, have, have sprung up uh, around the city itself. Gotcha. And what's the relationship between the men's team and the women's team? Is it close? Uh, do you guys, oh, it's a great you know, relationship, coach? yeah. Yeah. Every one of uh, just about every, every one of us up until this year had been a, had been a Bemidji State University grad. Uh, my, one of my, one of those nine seniors I referred to before, Mike Gibbons, he's now an assistant coach here, uh, on the men's side, uh, Tom Serratore, Travis Winter, both Bemidji grads. We're all, we all were right in the same building here. Their offices are just down the, just down the hall. So, uh, great, great relationship with, with the men's program. Uh, both our teams get along, uh, really, really well together. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the funnest parts about coming here is, is just, can go down there and talk hockey with those guys at any time and bounce ideas off them and, and ask about drills. And yeah, it's, it's a tremendous relationship. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Let, you, you kind of hinted at it. Let's talk about your, your uh, coaching staff. Uh, you have two assistant coaches. You actually, uh, Emma Terrace, who's uh, been there with you for a few years. And then you have a new uh, assistant coach, Sarah Bobrowski, who's replacing, you know, uh, a previous staff member who was there for 16 years. So just talk That's about right. your team, how you, uh, how you divide responsibilities. Um, you know, what's it like to, to work with the coaching staff? Yeah, I'm really, really excited about our staff. Emma, Emma's been with me now. This will be her third year. And she actually played for me. Uh, she was on board my very first year, 14, 15. She was a freshman. And uh, I, I actually coached against her the year before when I was at East Grand Forks. She came up with her high school, Robbinsdale Armstrong. So um, she scored a couple goals, but we beat her. So I, I, I remember, I, I remind her of that. But one of did you recruit her? I'm sorry, did you recruit her to Bemidji? Or no, she already she, committed? She'd already, and then... she'd already committed, yeah. She okay, had, yeah. She had been recruited by, by Mike Sertich and Amber Fricklin, who was, was with me uh, the first seven years or six years of my, of my tenure here. But she, Amber had recruited her. Okay. And so, uh, anyway, Emma was Emma became a captain, one of the best captains uh, that I've had in my in my tenure here. Just a, a tremendous uh, person, very very positive, and 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 she took she when Amber Amber uh, had gotten her doctorate degree and, and and took a professor job here at the at Bemidji State. So that created the opening for for uh, Emma to step in, and 
done a, just a tremendous job. And now this year, Sarah Bobrowski is joining us. She's originally from St. Paul, went to Hill Murray, uh, played three years out at Lindenwood where she had a really good career. Then her, her final year, uh, unfortunately, her sister had, had uh, got cancer. So she wanted to come back closer to home. And, and so she went to Hamlin and played for Coach Darwitz there, was an All-American and, and helped lead their team to the, to the final four for the first time. So uh, she's been up in Ottawa the last couple of years where her, her husband's a, a nurse there. She's been working with the Ottawa Senators in her in her skills clinician uh, position. So really excited to, to add Sarah. Again, just a real positive, outgoing person that's going to really connect well with young hockey players. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, let's talk about your tenure now at the at Bemidji State. Um, obviously, your first two years were uh, pretty amazing. You, you had over 20 wins, and then uh, since then, kind of a little bit up and down, but uh, this year you rebounded after a, a COVID year. Tell me kind of what's been the key to your success kind of this past season? Yeah, we did. That's a, we, we had a, I think the, the biggest thing my first few years, we had uh, Britt Moat was in goal and she was uh, unbelievable. I mean, she was a, she was a first team All-American her, her sophomore year, I believe, or maybe it was her junior year. And, and obviously in this league, goaltending is so important. And that's, that's, that's kind of, you know, where it started. And she was a big reason why we had the, the, those, those first two years we had, we racked up those wins, but uh, as you can imagine, it's a very, very challenging league. Uh, it's, it's every, every team has got tremendous coaches and, uh, it's, a it's, a that's one of the selling points is, is every, every weekend is a challenge for, if you want to, if you want to challenge yourself and playing in this league is, is, is you're going to do that. So, yep. uh, but yeah, the COVID year was definitely a, a tough year in terms of one loss record. I think we had nine games going to overtime, uh, that year and, uh, I mean, it was just unbelievable how, how often that would happen. I think we played 20 games and nine of them went in overtime. So, um, but this past year, I was just, it was, it, it was different. We carried 28 players, which was more than we'd ever carried before because of the, we had some fourth, uh, four fifth year players and we had a large incoming class and didn't really feel like telling them, no, I don't have a place for you anymore. So we just, we said, you know, we're going to carry all 28 and, you know, and I give Emma really a lot of credit. She, she, uh, came up with these leadership groups that she met with once a month. And, and a lot of it was just how, how, how to be a great teammate, even when it's, uh, even when you're not on the ice and how, how supportive you can be. And it's one of my, one of my most rewarding seasons. One of my funnest seasons is just coming to the rink every day, just a tremendous group, uh, worked really hard, had great leadership. And uh, they, they were, they were rewarded with some pretty, pretty big wins. And it was, it was a fun year. Gotcha, gotcha. And so I, I looked at your roster from last season, and I noticed it, it is definitely biased towards the Western North America. So obviously you got a lot of Minnesota, <laughs> but almost everybody is west of, you know, uh, Illinois, basically, in terms of the <laughs> yeah. players that you got. And, you know, you got a few Canadians. I think you got, you know, one or two Europeans. I can't remember exactly, but, uh, um, but mostly it's Western Canada and Western United States. Well, it's... Uh... Again, you know, Minnesota has been has been so good in terms of, of the number of players it's it's producing, and and obviously we're fortunate that we're a we're located in Minnesota. We're we're probably the farthest north. I think uh, if you draw draw drew a line, I think we're a little further north than Duluth. Uh, but uh, you know, I mean, Minnesota has been uh, tremendous in terms of developing players, and so that's really helped. But you're, we're certainly gonna, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to look up north of the border. There's tremendous hockey up there, so, you know, you're you're gonna try to go as, as, as wherever you have to. We do have some players coming in from Ontario this year, uh, uh, you know, more and more towards the Toronto area, not 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 necessarily Thunder Bay. So, uh, but you know, every every year is gonna be different. Uh, it's just always been a challenge to try to bring somebody from out on the east coast to bypass all those schools out there <laughs> to come to come to our come to our place, but. Um, you know, it's again, we know, we know it's, uh, we know we're a little bit unique in terms of, of, uh, what we have in terms of our size location. Uh, but I, I'll tell you the players that are here absolutely love it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Got a couple more I think questions related to your, your current team. Um, so one thing I noticed is, uh, you know, your goalies actually aren't that big, you know, usually you're, you, these days you're seeing five, 10, five, 11, six feet, but one of your goalies is five, four. I think the other one's five, six and your incoming one's five, eight. So finally you get a little bit more size. <laughs> um, you know, I'm assuming you're, you're given that you were a goalie, you know, you, you knew what you were doing when, when you picked them. So what, why is it that you kind of going against the brain in terms of goalie size? You know, I, that's, that's a good question. I think obviously you 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 want to get the best goalie you can, you know, for, for that, that particular class. And, 
uh, you know, Hannah Hoganson is 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 uh, probably the shortest, but you know, she she played the most games last year. But Hannah's just got tremendous feet. She's a tremendous skater. She's very aggressive, and, and you know, you've I'm sure you've heard it before. You goalies play they played bigger than they looked, and and that certainly fits her just because of her ability to skate. I mean, she'll she'll challenge a player, and challenge a shooter, and uh, again, just because of her ability to move her feet. Uh, Abby Thomas is a little bit bigger, a little taller. She's, uh, again, very, very athletic. And then uh, Madison Fauché coming in as a freshman, again, she's a, she's a little bit taller. But, uh, again, the bottom line is you got to stop the puck. And, the way, and there's, some, there's obviously some, some great goalies. You look at Erin Frankel, she's not very big, and she was probably the best goalie in the country for the last two years. So, yeah. Absolutely. So right. we're going to get back a little bit more to the goalie talk a little bit later on, but I'm going to take you back a few months to February 11th, 2022, of earlier this year. Um, and there was 14.6 seconds on the clock. Do you remember the game I'm referring to? And do you remember <laughs> what happened? Uh, maybe you could share with folks uh, the situation. Pretty, pretty, pretty tough to forget that one. Uh, yeah, we were, we were playing uh, Ohio State University. They're, they're ranked number one at the time. And, and uh, uh, it's 2-2 late in the game. I think there might have been maybe 45, 50 seconds when 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 uh, Nadine first pulled the goalie, and uh, you know again Nadine, I gave her Ohio State. State. She was, she was Nadine Muzzer, all the uh, sorry Nadine Muzzer, all the uh, head coach of the Ohio State women's program. Yeah. So just just being clear who you're referring to. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, they were they were they were in a dogfight for the overall uh, you know league championship, and and they realized in order to win it outright, they probably needed they needed all three points, and in order to get all three points, they were going to have to win the game in regulation because had it gone into overtime. Uh, then the most they would have gotten were two. So, uh, and, and she, you know, the, the ice was slanted a little bit, probably the, the last, uh, you know, seven, eight minutes of that game. So, you know, pretty calculated move on her part to pull a goalie. And and the last face off was, was about, like you said, 14 point some seconds and they won the draw. I remember the puck going to the front of the net and they, and they actually had us outnumbered. And I remember seeing the net open and, and their player, you know, going to shoot, I thought it's over, you know, they're going to win. And, and she kind of fanned on it and then got a little bit more on it and got it going towards the net. And, and Kerrigan Dowie, our goalie, just kind of reacted, just reflexes, just kind of did a pad stack kind of and just swung her bottom pad and, and kicked the puck off the goal line over into the corner. Yep. And Paige Beebe, who was the right wing, she went down, she's a right-handed shot. She, she got the puck and just turned and fired it uh towards their net and and i remember standing on the bench watching the puck looking at the clock seeing how much time was on it and seeing the where the puck was going i'm saying to myself this has got a chance and sure enough it goes in the net and i remember seeing time still on the clock and then the, and then the horn went off and so obviously it's pandemonium our bench is empties everybody's piling on the ice but Still had to, you know, there were zeros on the clock, so the, the officials had to go over and, and and look at it. And so, in the meantime, I'm trying to get the team back on the bench because if if there if it's a good goal and we felt it was, there was going to be a, some some kind of time left on the clock, and we're going to have to do a face off. So, finally, got everybody over to the bench. They signal a goal. I think they put like a tenth of a second back up on the clock, so we kind of had to do it all over again. But uh, yeah, it was, it was one of those games. It was just again just. Uh, being in that locker room after was 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 the best part about it. You just never forget how excited they were, and just the, the just you know they're just sharing their everybody's own experience, what they were doing. Uh, you know, just and again, it was it was uh, an unbelievable experience for our for our team, and a, definitely a memorable win. And um, after, Ohio, of course, everybody should know that Ohio State went on to win the national championship in, yep. in the Frozen Four. Um, that was their last and, loss. <laughs> and that's exactly what I was going to say. Do you get to go tell everybody you were the last team to beat uh, that Ohio State team? Yeah. Yeah, they came out. They came out the next night and they kind of stuck us pretty good. But uh, it was uh, still, it was, it was uh, again, a very memorable game and, and just so happy for our group to experience it. That was the best part about it. Yeah, really hard to, to kind of get back up for the game on, on your side. And I'm sure they were, uh, you know, full of uh, energy uh, to come after <laughs> yeah, you the next night. Sure. I'm sure they, they were not so happy with that. a little bit of a up. craw there, yeah. yeah. Was... And it also goes to show you what a great coach uh, Nadine Mazarol is at uh, being able to get the team really focused oh, back no the next doubt. day. Yeah. Too, uh, so. She's done a tremendous job there. 
Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So this leads into the, the, the kind of next WCHA kind of NCAA question is, what will it take for you guys to qualify for the NCAA playoffs? Because that's been a challenge for you, your, uh, your program. No question. No question. It, it, it's, uh, you know, in our league, it's been a, it's been a challenge because of the number of, of uh, the number of at-large bids you get, the quality of the teams in our league. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard it before. You, you, you know, you can, it's it's hard to keep your pairwise up to the point where you would be a, an, a, an at-large bid. Uh, you know, when you're playing the teams that we're playing four times a, a year, uh, you know, and, and traditionally you've seen Minnesota, Wisconsin, now Ohio State, Duluth the last couple of years. You know, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's a lot of hockey games against the top four teams. And in order to get your pairwise up, you have to win those games. So uh, like for, for, for a lot of teams, your best chance is a lot of times is winning that is winning winning your playoff championship. And my first year, we we were fortunate enough to to play in that in that game against uh, the University of Wisconsin. Uh, we we've been to it. Uh, we we were able to qualify for the for the, the you know the final face off in our league one other time. And, and, and again, that's it's it's a challenge, but that's that's what makes the league so good, and, and it's what it's what drives you because. That's where you want to be. You, you want to be a, you know, first of all, you want to be a, you want to win a championship in your league. You want to be a top four team so you get home ice and you want to qualify somehow for the NCAA tournament. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So well, now we're going to transition that into kind of my first recruiting question, but how it kind of impacts your, you know, your actual team. So, you know, they have this new transfer rule that uh, it makes it much easier to transfer between schools. And um, you've lost a couple of top players to kind of your, your WCHA rival. So I'm curious if you think these new rules have kind of um, impacted you kind of ending up being more of a feeder team to these top teams after these good players who play for you for a year or two, and then they move on to these other teams. Um, you know, are you, you know, some parents have talked to me saying like some of these teams end up, you know, kind of getting, you know, stiffed in terms of losing top players when they really shouldn't be if the rules weren't the way they were. You know, I, the rules are, the rules are, you know, they, they are what they are, right? So, and I, and I think the two players you're talking about, you know, for them, it was, it worked out not that they were, uh, necessarily down on our program. It was just the opportunity for them, you know, for, for Lauren Bench, it was an opportunity. She had, she had, she was finishing up her, she had redshirted. Uh, she had just, she had an opportunity. You know, we had some, we had some goalies come in and she had an opportunity to, to, uh, to, you know, to transfer and, and Minnesota just happened to be the school that, that came calling and, and it worked out for her. And, and I, it, again, it was just taking advantage of that, of that transfer portal you know, she was, she was able to make that move and be eligible right away. And in Claire's, Claire's case, she had finished her, she had graduated. She had finished her, her nursing degree and she was looking for an opportunity to be, to be a nurse anesthetist, but at the same time looking, you know, she had an opportunity to play for a, for a really good team that, that, you know, was, was a national champion, yeah. a national championship. So yeah. again, you know, part of it, part of it academics, no question, but obviously she took an opportunity to, to go to a team that at the time, looked like it had a really good opportunity to play in that championship. And then obviously it worked out for her to, to, to actually win it. So again, they just, they, they, they took advantage of these new rules and, and uh, you know, I certainly have no ill will toward any one of them. I, they were, they were great for us. They were, they're, they're wonderful people. And uh, they did great things for our program when they were here. And, and fortunately for them, they had an opportunity to, to, to play elsewhere. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Now let's get, really more specific into, you know, recruiting, not necessarily Bemidji State specific, but, you know, your philosophies on recruiting. Um, what is it that, you know, coaches like you look for in a goalie? Because um, I'm sure it's not just sitting in the stands watching them stop pucks. Uh, I'm sure there's a little bit more, uh, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, you know, we had Laura, Laura Bellamy on a couple episodes ago and, you know, she talked about, you know, give me 15 minutes watching them skate around and I can figure out who the top ones are and then give me another half an hour one-on-one -on -one with them in net. So what is it that you do and what is it that you look for for goalies when you're recruiting? Yeah, well, obviously she's done a great job too, right? I mean, you, you look at you look at the goalies that she's produced, and and uh, so she she's spot on. There's no question that skating is the is the number one thing you're you're looking for. But uh, you know, I, I for me personally, I think the goalie position is 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 the ultimate team position on a hockey team. You, you what I mean by that is is if you have a goalie that that's gonna is gonna just battle their tail off and fight for every puck, and and even when it's a five on old. They're going to do everything they can to keep that puck out of the net. Their teammates are going to see that, 
and they're just going to have that much more respect and they're going to work that much harder for that particular goalie. Uh, and on the other side, if you have a goalie that doesn't try very hard and is always pointing the fingers, it's your fault, get out of the way, you're screening me, you know, her teammates are going to look at her and go, well, the heck with you then. You, you can do it on your own. So that's why I say that, that goalie has to be the ultimate team, the, the ultimate team player. And, and again, working hard in practice, competing uh, as hard as you can all the time. Your teammates are going to recognize that. They're going to respect that. And they're going to work that much harder for you. So, and then having that, having that, uh, that mentality that you don't want to get scored on, I think is, is, is really, really important. Uh, but again, uh, skating, athleticism in general, I think is really, really important. Uh, uh, but again, having that, having that team first mindset and then really doing the best you can for your teammates and battle as hard as you can, no matter the situation or things we're going to look for. Gotcha. So if you go to a showcase and the goalie doesn't give up any goals, they don't automatically get a scholarship offer from you? <laughs> Not automatically. No, I mean, you gotta, you, you're going to do your due diligence for sure, right? You're going to, you're going to, you're going to certainly try to find out as much about that player as you can from, from her coaches and, and, and other people around her, but. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, generally you can tell, tell the, the good ones, uh, pretty quickly. Gotcha. Gotcha. So then pulling it back more not just you know, goalie specific, what non-skill, like what off ice characteristics are you looking for when you recruit for Bemidji State? A good, we want a good person first and foremost. Uh, that, that's to, to us, you know, we, we know that again, we're, we're not going to have the resources that some of the other schools in our, in our league have. Uh, but we can be we can be competitive with them because of the culture that we've created, and that that culture is is is, is knowing and believing that you're part of something bigger than yourself. Uh, and and we're gonna we're gonna uh, you know they're gonna be valued for who they are as people, uh, not for what they do on the ice. And and, and so they know that they're cared about. Uh, but having having good people is, is first and foremost uh, for us to have that to to have that that culture that we want here, uh, being able to put. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, a lot about uh, we before me, and that's so important to have that mindset and to really be supportive of your teammates. So that's probably the biggest thing is, is we want we want just good people. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Last couple of questions. What advice do you have for uh, players or parents who are kind of going through the recruiting process now? Um, you know, uh, obviously a lot less uh, positions or, or opportunities open because of COVID and the transfer portal. Um, you know, um, probably most of 2023 is committed, 2024 uh, just underway. You know, what advice do you have for some of these parents and players who are, who are going through it now and, and trying to figure out where the opportunities might be? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing I would tell them is, is it's really, really important that the recruiting process is theirs. And, it, and it, it's so easy to start looking around and seeing somebody else uh, has committed, maybe a, a teammate, a friend. And so you start you start panicking a little bit. Well, why why am I not get, getting those situations? But every every recruiting process is 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 is, is each, it's, it's an individual thing and it's their process. And they're the ones that are hopefully going to be in control of it. And, and we're a big believer, and we want we we want it to be an enjoyable experience, uh, and not something that's that's pressure packed and, and uh, necessarily for them to feel a lot of pressure. Uh, so, but it's it's really really important for for parents and players to understand that sometimes it's, it might take a little bit more time, and, and they've got to be patient and again control what you can control. Uh, don't don't you can't worry about outside things. Just just every time you're going on the ice, whether it's a showcase or once your season starts you always want to put your best foot forward because you never know who's watching. And, and but that's what you got to focus on, focus on what you can control, do the best you can. Uh, you know, things, if things are meant to work out, they're going to work out. Gotcha. Okay. Last question related to kind of uh, player development. Um, so you've been coaching girls now for uh, almost 15 years, at least um, beyond uh, coaching your, your daughter. Um, how has the, the skill level of uh, the women's game changed over the period since you first started coaching girls now uh, coaching women? Yeah, it, it's been unbelievable. The, the growth and just in my, just in my nine years here at Bemidji State University to, to see where it's at now, just to, the, the, the across every team in our league and it's throughout throughout the, the women's game across the country the talent level has just gotten so much better and it's 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 deeper there's there's uh it's not just one line that's that's really really good there's there are team fulls of really really good players and that's just a credit to all the youth coaches throughout the country all, all the development that everybody's doing in their hometowns and you know we're the beneficiary of it because we're seeing some really really tremendous hockey players and that's that's the exciting thing is how good 
the women's game has gotten and just to see where it's at just in my time. Uh, it's been remarkable. So it's, again, kudos to all the, all the, the youth programs out there that are, that are doing that development at the grassroots level uh, because there's some, some tremendous hockey players that, that we're, we're out going out to watch. Perfect, perfect. All right, so um, finally, why don't you share with folks how they could uh, get on your radar if they're interested in learning more about Bemidji State and kind of getting uh, wanting to be seen by you. Yeah, well, certainly, certainly uh, emails, uh, we get a lot of them. That's a great way just to, you know, send an email to, to either myself or either one of my assistants. Uh, certainly, plug, you know, put some video in there is, is great or, or mentioning that maybe you're, you're, you're on a, being live streamed or, you know, any, anything that gives us the opportunity to see uh, uh, is, is probably the best thing to go out. Certainly, you can find more about our program on our, on our website, uh, you know, bsubeavers.com. It's, it's, it's got a lot of information right there. But uh, yeah, we're, we're going to certainly try to get out to as many things as we can uh, this summer. But obviously, once the season starts, it gets to be a bit, bit more of a challenge, especially away from away from Minnesota. That's why those, the, the videos really help. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, Jim, I really want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was great learning about your kind of hockey background, being a goalie, uh, going to obviously Bemidji State, your long uh, coaching career, and then obviously learning about, about the uh, Bemidji State program. So uh, thank you so much for doing this. Well, I appreciate it. And thank you again. Uh, obviously, for, 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 for me, Bemidji State, like I said, has been a, a very, very special place. And it, it has that effect on you. It has that effect <laughs> on you. All right. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate your time. Appreciate having me on. I really want to thank Jim for coming on the podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the Bemidji State Women's Program or want to connect with Jim, you can find links to the team website and Jim's Champs app profile in the show notes. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Before you go, I wanted to share more about the app in Champs app. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know I spend a lot of time talking with coaches, parents, and players about the hockey recruiting process. One of the key questions that people want to know is, how does a player get noticed by college coaches? While there are many ways to be discovered, the easiest way to get on a college's radar is to send a coach an email and provide them all the information they need to assess if you are a player worth keeping their eyes on. That's where the app part of Champs app comes in. Champs app was designed based on all the conversations and feedback we received about the recruiting process, and we built a tool to help players and coaches connect with a ton of the information they want to know. It all starts with creating a free, beautiful Champs app profile. After that, there are some pretty magical things that can happen to help make the recruiting process a little less overwhelming. Your Champs app profile includes all the basic academic, personal, and athletic information coaches want to know. Then, by including video, schedule information, and your coach's contact details, colleges can easily start their evaluation process. You just copy and paste your personalized link and send it to coaches so they can see your public player profile without even having to log in or create a Champs app account. Or you can connect directly with coaches on Champs app. More and more coaches are creating their own Champs app profiles and connecting with players themselves every day. Now coaches can have all the information they need to assess where you might fit in their recruiting plans. Even better, college coaches can track your progress throughout the winter and showcase seasons because as you make changes to your profile, coaches will get notified to your updates. And in the future, we will be adding even more amazing features to improve your visibility to the recruiting process and hopefully increase your odds of success. If you wanna see what a player or coach profile looks like before you start your own, look in the show notes to see some examples. My kids and I have used Champs app for their recruiting process. In fact, my son was invited to a AAA tryout thanks to his Champs app profile. So go to www.champs.app and start your player or coach profile. It only takes about 15 to 20 minutes to complete most of your key information. Good luck, and please let us know how it helped with your recruiting journey.